Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of my podcast. I am exercise physiologist Joe Cannon, back for another week where I discuss different topics related to health and wellness. This topic this week will be no different. Hopefully your week is starting off pretty well. I can say my day today started off really well. I got up pretty early, almost before the sun got up, went for a nice long bike ride. Haven't done that in the morning in a while. And I came home, checked some emails, and then things kind of went down stairs from there. I actually had an email waiting for me from uh, somebody who used to be on my uh, newsletter list. I do a little newsletter where I send stuff out to people on a periodic basis. And this person actually wrote me and said, why are you reviewing dietary supplements that have no research on them? And I thought, well, if not me, then who? Why would I not review things that don't have any research on them? I mean, think about it. Just because there isn't any research doesn't mean people aren't asking the question. And if nobody talks about the fact that some of these products out there don't have any clinical research, then how are people going to know? So I thought that was kind of amusing. And then I also had another email from a woman who saw a, a video that I had done a while back on a menopause supplement and basically discounted what I said because I'm not a woman. And again, I laugh and I thought to myself, are you discriminating against me because I'm a guy? Again, if I don't do that research, that review, who will? How are you going to know if some of these dietary supplements you see on the internet and on TV really live up to their claims if somebody out there who knows what they're talking about doesn't discuss them? Anyway, so that's kind of how my day is starting out so well. <laughs> there was some good and there was eh, not so good. It really wasn't a big deal. You know, I'm, I'm always happy for the feedback, the positive and the negative feedback. And I did write back to uh, these people and said, hey, you know, you want to elaborate, want to have a conversation? Eh, I don't expect I'll hear back from them. Hopefully I will. But usually when I get emails like that, people don't reply back to me. But Regardless, it is what it is. If anything, you know, you know what they say about people who stand in the middle of the street, they get hit. So you got to take a side one way or the other. And, you know, some people don't necessarily like the side I take, but, you know, I got to I got to do what I got to do. That said, on to better things. No more venting. So this is, if you have been keeping count, this is actually episode number 5050, the big 50. I've actually been doing these podcast episodes for just under one year. I was actually kind of surprised when I noticed I was up to episode 50. Uh, this, this, uh, this year has actually gone by pretty fast. I don't know about you, but I'm having fun doing this, and I don't have any plans on stopping anytime soon. So um, because this is episode 50, you know, I thought, let me do something a little different. This week, I haven't talked about this topic before, but I want to spend some time discussing it. Uh, it is sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is, again, a topic that I haven't formally discussed on the podcast lately. If you've ever heard me talk in person, you know that occasionally I do go off on this topic. I do call sarcopenia the disease that almost everybody gets, but very few have ever heard of it. And so what I want to do with our time this week is talk about this process called sarcopenia and what it is, why it is, as I often say, a national security problem, and basically also give you some ideas on what you can do to prevent sarcopenia and even, yes, I'll say it, reverse it. So you may be wondering, what the heck is Joe talking about this week? Is he lost his marbles? What is sarcopenia? So sarcopenia in its basic sense is nothing more than the age-related loss of muscle. As we get older, we lose muscle tissue. Our muscles get smaller and our muscles get weaker. Now, before I go any further, let me point out that sarcopenia is not really the same thing as atrophy. Atrophy is the loss of muscle strength and muscle size, but atrophy can happen at any age. You could be 10 years old, have a cast in your arm because you broke your arm and it cut off the cast, and again, your muscles will be weaker because you haven't used it. Sarcopenia is unique in that it is specific to muscle loss as we get older. 
the older we get, the more likely sarcopenia is to occur. And there have been various studies over the years on this that have reported that anywhere from maybe 3% to maybe 24% of people over the age of 65 have various degrees of sarcopenia. Sometimes they'll even be classified as pre-sarcopenia. Yeah, that's even a term too. That's you're on your way to getting sarcopenia. But again, as we get older, the loss of muscle strength, muscle size becomes more apparent. As a matter of fact, for people over the age of 70, for men over the age of 70, generally speaking, we tend to lose about 1% of muscle per year, again, after the age of 70. For women, it's a little less. For women, it's, it's estimated to be about 0.7%, 0.07% per year. So a little bit less, but generally speaking, 0.7, 1%, you know, it's, it's basically about 1% per year for men and women across the board after the age of 70. So it tends to increase as we get older. That said, sarcopenia does affect both men and women, but I ultimately think that this is more of a woman's issue. Because women, well, they outlive us guys by several years. And so I think that women will live with the problems of sarcopenia longer than men. So again, I, I do think this, again, is a, is a public health problem. It's a national security problem. But I also think sarcopenia is a woman's issue that very few people are discussing. One thing about sarcopenia that I want to mention right out of the gate, one of the things that I think the reason why this is such a problem is that... When I say sarcopenia is the loss of muscle as we get older, in reality, when I'm talking about it is it is the loss of fast twitch muscle fibers as we get older. So let me take a step back. If you're not familiar with this term, fast twitch, we have in our bodies fast twitch muscle and slow twitch muscle. Twitch essentially means contraction speed. Uh, fast twitch muscle contracts or twitches faster than a slow twitch muscle. Both fast and twitch muscle, fast twitch muscle and slow twitch muscle, they have their place in the world, but fast twitch muscle are the powerful muscle fibers. They're the muscle fibers you're using when you're walking up steps, getting off a toilet, getting off the floor, carrying groceries up a flight of stairs. Those are the, stra the strong and powerful muscle fibers. Turns out sarcopenia almost selectively destroys those fast twitch muscle fibers as we get older. And we're going to talk about why that is today. But again, that is a problem because the less powerful you are, the less able someone can take care of themselves. And while I call them fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers, I know for those who are listening to me with who have backgrounds in medicine, exercise, science, I'm, I'm essentially referring to what is more technically called type 2 muscle fibers, type 2A and type 2B muscle fibers. That's a more technical term for fast twitch. We basically just call them fast twitch muscle fibers. And again, sarcopenia is the almost preferential loss, destruction, if you will, of those fast twitch muscle fibers. Again, those fibers that are powerful as they're lost, well, then we become weaker. And that's a problem in and of itself. But as we become weaker, we move less because it becomes harder to move our body around. We're getting weaker. Well, if we're not moving as much, if we're not, say, exercising as much, well, then other diseases begin to increase. Such as, for instance, as we get less physical activity, diabetes increases, heart disease increases, cancer increases, diabetes, osteoporosis, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, they all increase. I sometimes liken sarcopenia as a gateway disease, which opens up the doorway to other health problems. Again, a lot of health issues are related to not moving as much, not exercising as much. So anything that hinders our ability to move, like not being strong enough to move, will increase the risk of a whole host of other diseases. Hey, how about falls? Yeah, think about it. The weaker someone is, the more likely they are to fall. And if they fall, they're more likely to break bones because their bones are weaker. So... You get why I get a little animated when I talk about this. Sarcopenia is big 
problems. And again, it's a big problem that very few people are talking about. And that's why I wanted to take episode 50 to discuss this at length with you. So you hopefully understand what sarcopenia is better and also go out and tell other people about it. Because I got to tell you, there aren't many people out there talking about sarcopenia and why it is such a devastating disease. And if, for instance, you're listening to me and you're saying, but I'm not 70, I'm not 60, I'm, I'm in my 40s, I'm good. Hey, what, one of the things I want you to realize about sarcopenia is that this is technically not an older person disorder. Sarcopenia begins when we are younger. As a matter of fact, that muscle loss that we're talking about here, muscle loss begins in the mid 40s. Generally speaking, when people are in their mid 40s, sometimes even a little younger than that, we begin to lose muscle. And so that's why sarcopenia is a disorder that should be addressed not necessarily when someone is 70, 80, 90. Sarcopenia, I think, is a problem that should be addressed when we're younger. I would even go as far as to say is sarcopenia should be addressed when we are children. Yeah, I think this is a condition that should be discussed in elementary school, in high school, in junior high school. The earlier you can educate people about this devastating disorder, the less likely I think it is to occur in the future when we are older. Oh, and if when I said we start to lose muscle in our mid-40s, some of you may have keyed in and said to yourself, well, isn't that kind of when we start to lose bone as well? Yeah, loss of muscle and loss of bone, they can parallel each other. And that makes sense because the muscles are attached to the bone. And as we move those muscles less, they pull on the bones less. And so as muscles get weaker, so too do the bones. So if, for instance, you've ever had a bone density test, maybe your doctor has prescribed one of these, and maybe the bone density test has said you have, say, osteopenia or osteoporosis, well, then you could assume you also have sarcopenia as well. Hey, I use those words on purpose. Osteopenia and sarcopenia. Notice the similarities in those names. Osteopenia means you've lost a lot of bone. Sarcopenia means you've lost a lot of muscle. So you see how those words kind of are similar to each other and they kind of can go hand in hand. So again, sarcopenia, big problem, loss of muscle as we get older. And again, it is the almost preferential loss of those fast twitch muscle fibers. So you may be wondering why, why do we lose more of these fast twitch muscle fibers as we get older? Why do we tend to hold on to more of our slow twitch muscle fibers? I think the simple answer is as we get older, we don't do as much resistance training, strength training as when we're younger. And so if you don't stress the body, if you don't stress the muscles, why do you need to keep those strong and powerful muscle fibers around? And as you have less and less of these fast twitch powerful muscle fibers, we tend to not only get weaker, but we also tend to get slower. We don't walk as fast when we're older. And again, it's complicated. One of the reasons why we, I think people tend to walk slower as they get older is they're afraid of falling. And so they slow down. So again, I'm, I'm giving you sometimes a simple answer here, but notice that again, biology can be a little complicated. And so sometimes people will walk slower because they're afraid of losing their balance and falling. But walking slower may be a sign as well of sarcopenia because as they lose those fast twitch fibers, their muscles can't contract as fast and they tend to walk slower. And that actually could be one of the ways in which doctors could diagnose sarcopenia. There are tests out there where they'll measure how fast someone can walk. So again, if you are, say, in the fitness world and you're working maybe with older adults, maybe take a look at how quickly they're walking. It could give you some insights. Again, things are not always clear cut as this, but very slow walking could be a sign of sarcopenia. It could be a problem with balance as well. But sarcopenia, again, becomes more and more prevalent as we get older. Now, 
I've said sarcopenia a lot and, you know, I, I haven't even kept track, but I, I know I've said it over and over again, but it is the loss of muscle strength and muscle size. That said, I do want to bring another term to your attention. This term doesn't really get as much publicity, if you will, as sarcopenia, but the term I want to bring to your attention is called dinopenia. Dinopenia. Dino means power, power and strength. And so sarcopenia is often used interchangeably with dinopenia, but technically they're not the same thing. Sarcopenia is the loss of muscle size. Dinopenia is the loss of muscle strength. And so while I'm guilty of this myself, I tend to use sarcopenia as the loss of, and I, I said this earlier today, the loss of muscle size and strength. Technically it's dinopenia that actually is the loss of muscle strength. So they're not that really the same thing, but for most people, one is going to be used interchangeably with another, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're really the same thing. For instance, loss of muscle strength, dinopenia, can occur two to five times faster than the loss of muscle size. Let me say that again, because I know it, it, these words kind of run together sometimes, especially if you're driving while you're listening to me. The loss of muscle strength dinopenia, can occur two to five times faster than the loss of muscle size. So muscle strength and muscle size don't always go hand in hand with each other. Someone might look like they have a lot of muscle mass, but they might be lacking in muscle strength. Now, I get we're kind of splitting hairs here, but I thought that dinopenia was worth mentioning because, you know, as I often say, most people have never heard of sarcopenia, but even fewer out there have even heard of dinopenia. So I wanted to bring it to your attention, if, if nothing else, to just give you some things to think about. But generally speaking, throughout the rest of our time this week, whenever I say sarcopenia, assume I'm also talking about dinopenia. Again, I'm again I'm a split in hairs here, but you know, I think I think words are really neat, and I'm also a big fan of knowledge. Knowledge is power. So the more knowledge you have, the more powerful you are. Again, the also the better questions you can ask your doctor when you do go in for a doctor's visit. You know, generally speaking, again, off topic here, but average doctor visit is only about three to five minutes, at least here in America, it's three to five minutes. And so doctors probably may not have the time to bring all this stuff up, you know, when you're in that little room talking to the physician. And so the more information you have, the better questions you can ask that doctor when you do see her or him. I mentioned a couple times so far that I, I tend to refer to sarcopenia as a disease. And some may not like the fact that I called it a disease, but I'm in good company because it turns out the World Health Organization has also designated sarcopenia as a disease. As a matter of fact, it actually even has its own medical code. And so for you medical coders out there who are listening to me, it, it, the medical code, I actually looked this one up. The medical code for sarcopenia is M62.84. M62.84 is the ICD medical code for sarcopenia. So there, bam, sarcopenia is a disease. And I think that's a good thing because if you recognize this as a disease, hopefully that's going to spark a discussion about the sarcopenia and the ramifications of being weak and also get some more research done on this because the more research we do, the, the better our conversations can be and the ultimately down the road, the more people we can help. Because at the end of the day, you know, loss of strength, loss of muscle size, whatever you want to call it, this is a quality of life issue. If you're not strong enough to take care of yourself, well, then you're in a lot of trouble. So your quality of life is going to stink. You're, you're going to be at greater risk of falls. And ultimately, if we take this to its ultimate conclusion, then someone's at a greater risk of being in a nursing home, which is definitely not where someone wants to be. So this is why I tend to refer to sarcopenia as a public health issue. It's a national security issue too, but it's also a public health issue. And I call it that because, you know, think about this in, in, in the big picture. So... Most of us who are listening to me are in America and, you know, from time to time you hear these talks about how we're going to provide health care for everybody. Well, 
how in the world are you going to provide health care for a nation of sick, weak people who were ravaged by disease? It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. People don't want to hear that, but you can't continue to ensure a nation of sick people. Beyond that, again, it gets to why I call this a national security problem. Nobody wants war, but unfortunately, these things do happen from time to time. But who in the heck's going to fight the wars of the United States or any country for that matter if the nation is populated by a bunch of weak individuals who are ravaged by disease? This is a conversation we need to be having. As I'm talking to you now, we're coming up on an election year and there's going to be, you know, debates. I don't hear anybody talking about this. You know, everybody likes to say they want to provide, you know, national health care and all that stuff. Great. How in the world are you going to do it? You just can't keep throwing money at stuff. You got to address the root cause. A lot of diseases out there are caused by lack of exercise and again, not eating very well. If you could figure out how to get people to move more and eat better, you can do a lot of reducing not only sarcopenia, but a lot of other diseases as well. So that's the conversation I personally would like to hear our politicians talking about. They may be talking about them in other countries, but at least here in America, when I do tend to pay attention, I don't hear anybody talking about this. And sidebar for a minute, as proof of this, that America is turning into a nation of weak individuals who are sick, I remember a few years ago, I happened to be, you know, just channel surfing one afternoon and I come across, I, I don't know, I, it was probably like Bloomberg TV or something like that. One of those, you know, financial things. They have the CEO, I guess he was the CEO of Aetna, the big giant insurance company. And, you know, he's talking at this point about how Aetna is pulling out of the Affordable Care Act what we in America tend to call sometimes Obamacare, all right? So he's he basically says, we're, we're pulling out of it. Okay, why was Aetna pulling out of the Affordable Care Act? He basically says on television, we underestimated how unhealthy the American public, American public were. Wait a minute. They underestimated how unhealthy the American people were, and it was getting too expensive for them to stay in that system. There were more sick people signing up for the Affordable Care Act than not so sick people. And so they had a deluge of medical requests that they had to pay and they couldn't keep doing it. So they basically said, we're out. That goes to why I say sarcopenia is a national security problem and a national health care problem. It's a discussion that we need to be having because unless you're paying attention, you're not going to hear this. And it was a fluke that I actually heard it, to be honest with you. But it's something that stuck with me. And as I was recording this episode and, and preparing for it, I actually was searching on the internet for that quote because it was on video. Fortunately, I wasn't able to find it, but it stuck with me. And it happened about three or four years ago. Whenever they pulled out, that's when uh, this, this conversation was had. But I usually tell that to people because, again, it, it insurance companies – they are having trouble paying for all these health problems. And so I got to think that anybody who says, oh, the government can do it, government ain't going to be able to do that either. It's going to cost a lot of money either way, you, either way you slice this. And so if you have a population that is healthier and stronger and more fit, well, then you can keep healthcare costs down. Think about that as you watch the debates on television, which are sure to come up this year. That's my take on the national security issue of, of this whole sarcopenic, dinopenic issue. But beyond that, I know this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And if you're not paying attention to it, you're not going to see it. For instance, I'm thinking about how a while ago I find myself in a furniture store, you know, at one of those stores where they have, you know, the reclining chairs and all that stuff. Well, as I'm meandering around the store, I find chairs that literally pick you up out of the chair to get you into a standing position. These are motorized chairs where the seat actually increases. It goes up to push somebody up to a standing position. Wait a minute. 
These chairs are designed for people who are no longer strong enough to stand up from a seated position. They can't get off their butt anymore. They can't get out of a chair. They can't get out of a chair. They cannot get off a toilet. Which goes back to my original premise, if you cannot take care of yourself anymore, you're going to wind up in a nursing home. And you got companies out there, like, like these companies, that are basically providing a service for people who can no longer stand up. Why not be a little proactive and start doing some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this episode to keep your body stronger? Again, I, I get why some people may need these chairs. The fact that there were so many of them in this store made me wonder if they were just providing a service for people who didn't know about the things that I'm going to tell you about in this episode. Related to that is all you got to do is turn on daytime TV and watch the commercials. The commercials are all about, we got syringes, we got, we got, we got uh, tubing for your disease, for your, for your diabetes. We've got, we've got these devices, these chair lift things that pick you up the steps when you can no longer walk up steps anymore. These are all devices and technologies that are designed to address the fact that Americans are getting weaker. And so they're filling a service. I get that. But to be honest with you, I'd like to put them all out of business. One way we put them all out of business is we become a stronger, more healthier nation. And one of the ways we do that is we address sarcopenia. My tangential talking aside here, you may be saying, well, this is great, Joe. Let's get to the meat of this talk here today. What the heck can we do about sarcopenia? What causes sarcopenia and what can we do about it? The causes of sarcopenia are numerous. There's a bunch of them. I'm actually thinking, I'm going to give you several of them right here, but realize that it is complicated. So let me just give you, I've got several, several causes of sarcopenia, and then I want to drill down and give you what I think are the best ways to address this phenomenon. Number one, the number one cause of sarcopenia is lack of regular physical activity, lack of resistance exercise. You're no longer stressing your muscles like you were when you were, say, a teenager or your 20s or your 30s anymore. So that's the number one thing, lack of regular physical exercise. And, and that actually is the number one thing we can do to help reverse sarcopenia as well. I'm going to circle back and talk about that. Number two. This gets a little bit more complicated, but as we get older, we have a reduction in muscle protein synthesis. And that's fancy talk for we don't build muscle as easily in our 70s as we did in our 20s. There again, we're getting complicated here and we are talking about the aging process to a degree. As we get older, eh, things do tend to slow down. And the muscle building process tends to slow down as well. So that's something that we can, we can deal with to a degree. But again, things do tend to slow down as we get older. Along the same lines of reduced muscle protein synthesis, there is also an increase in muscle protein breakdown. Yeah, we tend to break down protein, not just muscle protein, but other proteins as we tend to get older. There is some aging process stuff going on here, and we haven't figured out the aging process yet, unfortunately, but there are some things that will increase our muscle breakdown, our loss of muscle. And one thing I want to bring, bring your attention is lack of calories. Lack of calories. Calories are energy. And if we're not eating enough calories as we get older, well, then the body is going to go looking for an energy source. And what's it going to find? Protein, amino acids, amino acids that make up protein. You know, normally when you're making energy, you're burning fat and you're burning carbs. Those are your main energy sources. If you're not eating enough carbs and, and fat and calories in general, if you're not eating enough of these, these, these energy stuffs, well, then the body's going to go looking for an alternative fuel source and it's going to start breaking down protein. It's going to break those proteins down into amino acids, and it's going to turn some of those amino acids into sugar. You can use sugar to make energy. 
And so this sets off a vicious cycle, which is technically called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the fancy sciency word for the formation of glucose, sugar, from non-sugar compounds. So you're basically means you're turning protein into sugar to burn the sugar to make energy from it. That's a problem because protein is everywhere. It's in your muscles, it's in your skin, it's in your hair, it's in your red and white blood cells. There's protein in every cell of your body. And as you start breaking down protein, well, you get the idea. The scaffolding of your body is going to start to eventually break down, which again is going to make this sarcopenic process even worse. Related to that, I want to jump a little bit over to another topic which maybe you've heard about lately and that's there's a very popular diet out there that a lot of you may be doing right now it's called the ketogenic diet so the ketogenic diet is essentially a high fat low carb diet and you can lose a lot of weight with the ketogenic diet absolutely but what i want to point out to you is something that i've been saying a long time is that the ketogenic diet in my opinion is not a longevity diet it's not a long, it's not a diet that you should follow if you're trying to live to 100. I think that, you know, you can improve different disease processes by going on the ketogenic diet because as you're losing weight, your blood sugar gets better, etc. But long term, a there's no long term studies of the ketogenic diet yet, but there is preliminary evidence that the ketogenic diet may lead to muscle loss. And even exercise does not appear to stop this muscle loss. Again, the research is preliminary. There's not as many keto exercise studies out there at this point as I'm talking to you as I like. Hopefully, they're in the pipeline and we'll know more in the future. But just know that if you're doing the ketogenic diet, I really want you to exercise if you're doing a ketogenic diet. But also realize that I don't think it's a long-term solution for weight loss. Again, it's a different story for a different time. But most people on keto can't maintain their weight loss. We go, again, was a discussion for another day. But the muscle loss which may occur with keto is something that concerns me. And hopefully, we'll have a better idea about this uh, in the coming years. But uh, again, it, regardless, it's just not my favorite diet out there. So we've got lack of physical activity, lack of proper exercise, and we'll talk about proper exercise in this episode. There's a reduction in muscle protein synthesis, and there's an increase in muscle breakdown, which again is probably linked to reduction in protein and reduction in calories. But along those same lines is we're not making as many anabolic hormones anymore. So our testosterone levels don't go up as high and we can't use testosterone as well as we're and we're older. Same thing is true for growth hormone and, and other anabolic hormones as well. A, we're not making as many of these anabolic hormones, and those hormones that we do make, we're not using them as well as when we were 20s and 30s and 40s. This leads to a condition called anabolic resistance. Anabolic resistance. It is the inability to use anabolic hormones. Those anabolic hormones don't work as well anymore. You may have heard of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is one of the preludes to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance is a phenomenon where, yeah, you're making insulin, but it's not working so well anymore. Anabolic resistance is you're making some of these anabolic hormones, but they're not working as well either. Anabolic resistance is something, again, that doesn't get talked about a lot, but I wanted to go a little bit more in depth in this episode to give you some more tools so you can discuss all this with your physician uh, when you do see him or her. Another hormone. Can't talk about anabolic hormones without talking about this next one, and that's insulin. So, yeah. Insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's not just the hormone that we all know that helps us put sugar in the cells to make energy from. Turns out that insulin also helps us utilize amino acids. It transports amino acids into the cell to help us make protein. Well, again, as insulin's not working so well, as we become insulin resistant, this can also speed the sarcopenic process by interfering with muscle protein synthesis, the process of building muscle tissue. So if you have type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, sometimes called metabolic syndrome, sarcopenia is something that uh, you should also be thinking about. 
So as you deal with your type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, this is also something that can help sarcopenia. Something else that's kind of controversial, whether we can deal with it or not, is our brain, our nervous system, talks to our muscles. It sends signals to our muscles. And that's why when you say, pick something up, it's because your brain said, pick something up. Sometimes those connections between the brain and the muscles, well, they're not as great as we get older. We tend to lose communication between our, our central nervous system, our brain, if you will, and our muscles. And so if we can't send the proper signals to the muscle, the muscle tends to start to atrophy. And again, if you're not working your fast twitch muscle fibers through doing, say, resistance exercise, that can speed that process along. So it's controversial whether we can build those communications systems back up between the brain and the muscles, but that is another possible cause, or at least something that does contribute to the sarcopenic process. Another thing that does occur with sarcopenia, and I'll circle back and talk about this in, in a few moments, and that is there's an increase in free radical damage in the body. Free radicals, these are rogue atoms and molecules that go around the cell and they disrupt normal cellular process. They damage cells and DNA so they don't work as well anymore. So there's an increase in free radical damage and corresponding with that, there's also an increase in cellular inflammation. A lot of diseases out there are associated with an increase in inflammation of the body, inappropriate inflammation, I should say you know, diabetes and cancer and heart disease, they're associated with an increase in inflammation. You may, for instance, when you went to your doctor, perhaps maybe your doctor had done a blood test to measure inflammation. It's called the CRP test, the CRP, where C is the letter C, and then the other part of it is reactive protein. So C, reactive protein, this is a blood test measurement of inflammation. And sometimes doctors will measure CRP levels as an indicator of how inflamed somebody is. There's good inflammation and there's not so good inflammation. And CRP levels can give a doctor information on inappropriate, not so good inflammation. So we've got an increase in free radical damage. We've got an increase in cellular inflammation and then something else that is also involved in sarcopenia, and that is dysfunction in the mitochondria. And I wanted to bring this up because the mitochondria is really, really popular these days. I'm kind of glad that it's getting the attention that it deserves. The mitochondria is, you may have heard it called the powerhouse of a cell. I liken the mitochondria to batteries. The mitochondria is where we make a lot of our energy. And it turns out that anything that disrupts the function of the mitochondria will reduce our cellular energy production. And again, the mitochondria, if, if, if you're probably connecting the dots right now, you probably already know that the mitochondria is a very popular area of anti-aging research. Some out there are promoting uh, the idea that if you can re revamp or regenerate your mitochondria, well, then this may in turn help us grow younger and be healthier. And there are dietary supplements out there which do purport to help the functioning of the mitochondria. You may be taking some of these. They're usually based in and around the vitamin niacin. If you go back in the archives of my podcast, you will find my discussions of these uh, vitamins, the most popular of which is a form of niacin called nicotinamide riboside, nicotinamide riboside, which is a form of niacin essentially. And there is some interesting research that it may help the mitochondria. So I, I won't talk about nicotinamide riboside here. I'll just simply say, go back in the archives. Uh, I, I forget what episode it is, but it's pretty easy to find. So again, look for that for more on the research on that particular vitamin. But mitochondrial problems, dysfunction in the mitochondria, again, they lead most likely to an increase in free radical production and inflammation. So you see how all these things are related to each other. You've got problems with the mitochondria, which increase free radical production, which increase cellular inflammation and perhaps causing changes in as we get older with hormones that coupled with the fact that maybe our central nervous system is not talking to the muscle so well leads to decreases in protein synthesis. It is, for lack of a better phrase, a vicious cycle. It's a big snowball of, of things that come together 
that cause this sarcopenic process. And you may be saying to yourself, you know, holy mackerel, Joe, this is complicated and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, there is. And the answer to sarcopenia is simpler than you think. Again, I'm going to talk about that in a few moments. But I wanted to give you some indication of how complicated this is, give you some idea of some of the biological mechanisms behind sarcopenia, because I'm a fan of knowledge. Knowledge is power. And again, as I've said before, the more knowledge you have, the better you are able to deal with this very, very insidious medical disorder. Oh, one thing I didn't talk about yet, which I, I really should have. That should have been probably the number one or number two thing I talked about. And that's body composition. So it does appear that another factor that plays a role in the development of sarcopenia is the amount of fat on someone's body. Usually when I talk about sarcopenia in lectures I give, often sometimes show people pictures of, of really, really skinny people. And, and, I, and this, the thighs are really skinny and the calves are really skinny and the butt is really skinny. And I usually show people that, it, again, to get their attention because remember sarcopenia affects mostly those fast twitch muscle fibers. Turns out that we have a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers in the butt and in the thighs. And so maybe an indication of sarcopenia is a skinny butt and skinny thigh muscles. And while that is possible, what I don't usually bring up is the other part of sarcopenia. And, and again, it's, it doesn't get a lot of publicity, but it is nonetheless something that does need to be discussed. And that is obesity-related sarcopenia. A lot of people don't want to talk about obesity-related sarcopenia. It's not politically correct, but it is important to realize the more body fat someone has on their body, that also can disrupt hormones and that can speed this sarcopenic process along. So the amount of muscle and fat in the body definitely can factor into uh, whether or not someone has sarcopenia. And while it's sometimes easy to see sarcopenia on a really, really older skinny person, it's a little bit more difficult in somebody who's overweight because they're overweight. Uh, so, but as a rule, I would say that, you know, someone who's say three and 400 pounds, they probably have sarcopenia too. It's just that you can't see it as easily as you can see it on somebody who's really, really skinny. I mentioned uh, a few times during our discussion this week about how as we move less, we get more muscle loss, more muscle uh, atrophy, if we will, more sarcopenia. And the more we stay in bed, the faster this actually happens. And again, this is kind of an extreme case, you may think, but it, 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 there have been research studies of people who literally are put in bed and they're not allowed to move. You spend 24 hours a day in bed. Scientists will do this to see what happens. Well, as you can imagine, not a lot of good stuff happens. We tend to atrophy really, really fast when we don't move. So it turns out that after 10 days of bed rest, we lose about two pounds of muscle. Let me say that again. 10 days of solid bed rest leads to about two pounds of lost muscle. In fact, remember, there's a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers in the thighs. And it turns out that 10 days of bed rest leads to about a 10% decrease in loss in the thigh muscle strength. Again, just after 10 days of bed rest. Why is that important? Well, sometimes people are in nursing homes and they sometimes don't want them to move. That's an issue right there. That's an issue for, the, for most people. But the other thing that kind of sparks my imagination when I think about this are those men and women who right now are on the International Space Station. There ain't no gravity in outer space. And if you go on YouTube, then you can see the exercise device they actually use to maintain strength and, and in, in outer space. And that's a problem because uh, we apparently are going to Mars within the next decade or so. Uh, yeah, that's right. The men and women who will set foot on the planet Mars are alive right now and are most likely in college, if not training to be a Mars astronaut right this second. I think that's kind of cool that we're living basically in the future right now. We're living in, in what what is kind of like science fiction world. Things are happening now that sometimes you'd see only in those old 1950s sci-fi movies, but it actually is pretty kind of cool. But 
it's going to take about seven to nine months to get to Mars. Those astronauts will have to exercise daily to maintain their muscle. And if you've ever seen an astronaut return to Earth after being in space, it's a challenge for them to stand up at first because, again, there's no gravity in space. So muscle loss and bone loss happen very quickly in zero gravity. So it's, it's a challenge for NASA and uh, the European Space Agency, et cetera, to deal with this whole sarcopenic process because sarcopenia does happen in astronauts. If we go back down to Earth, again, it's more of an issue for us as we get older, especially you know if we're you know really older and we're in a nursing home. Now that I may have just scared you about sarcopenia, I do want you to know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Sarcopenia is not necessarily going to be a death sentence. It is not something that we can't do things about. So what I want to spend the remainder of our time this week talking about are what are some things that you can do right now to maintain your muscle size and your muscle strength to give you a better quality of life so God forbid you don't end up in a nursing home one day. And the number one thing that I do want to bring to your attention is what I've already kind of talked about, but I want to talk about it again, and that's exercise. When I say exercise, I'm really referring to resistance exercise, strength training. You got to work those muscles. This is the biggest and best thing that we can do to offset sarcopenia and reverse it. We got to work those muscles. Again, for those in a nursing home right now, it breaks my heart if you've ever visited a nursing home, and I have, I have seen it up close and personal. I know what goes on in somebody's, somebody's facilities. The worse the person gets, the more they don't want them to move. They want them to be in bed all the time. Remember, the more you're in bed, the faster you lose muscle. Why do they want them to be in bed? It's a fall risk. The weaker they are, the more likely they are to fall. So the rationale in a nursing home is, well, let's just stop them from falling. Let's just put them in bed. The problem, however, is again, it accelerates sarcopenia. It accelerates that condition. Oh, and by the way, speaking of nursing homes, those with sarcopenia are 50% more likely to be admitted to a nursing home. It gets back to what I said all before. Sarcopenia is a public health problem if we can't take care of ourselves. And by taking care of ourselves, I mean being able to get out of a chair, walk up steps, get out of a car, get off the toilet. If we can't do that, well, then we can't take care of ourselves. If we can't do that, eventually people are going to wind up in a nursing home where they're going to turn around and say, well, just stay in bed, which spirals this effect even more out of control. Exercise is important, but as we get older, we tend to do less resistance training. As we get older, we tend to do less strength training. And so as we work the muscles less, we get weaker. And as we get weaker, we move less. And we move less because it gets harder to move our bodies. And so as we move less, we in turn get even more weaker. And then unfortunately, one day we fall and we can't get up. And again, that's how many people wind up in a nursing home. So, you know, it's, it's a vicious cycle. And, that, and, I, and I've come back to that several times in our conversation this week because, again, it's not something that a lot of people talk about. It's uncomfortable to talk about these things. But gee whiz, gang, if we don't talk about it, we can't do anything about it. And so I think, again, this is a conversation that I, I think America needs to be having as well as other countries as well. And I know a lot of you are listening to me in Europe and other countries as well. And I'm, I'm more familiar with the healthcare problems in America and less so in other countries. But sarcopenia is as relevant for Americans as it is relevant for all over the world. This is a human issue, not a issue that is relegated to different geographical regions of the earth. Sometimes when I speak to groups, I talk about sarcopenia. And one of the statistics I sometimes throw out to people is that if someone's in a nursing home, it turns out that about 50% of people in nursing homes are over the age of 85. And while that's good news because, you know, as humans, we're living longer and that's a good thing. Heck, my grandmother lived to well over 100. So we are living longer. But 
less than 1% of people over the age of 85 do any kind of strength training. Let me say that again. 50% of people in nursing homes right now are over the age of 85, but yet less than 1% of those over age 85 individuals do any kind of resistance training. Is that a coincidence? No, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think a lot of people are in nursing homes right now, not because they have dementia, but it's because they can no longer take care of themselves anymore. They're not strong enough because nobody told them the stuff that I'm telling you right now that we have within our grasp, the power to reverse sarcopenia, to improve our quality of life, to help keep healthcare costs down and to give us a better, longer lifespan. Strength training is one of the best things we can do to offset this condition. Yes, cardio is good. Walking is good. Heck, when I got up this morning, I went for an eight mile bike ride. I love riding my bike, but it's cardio. It's aerobic. Aerobic exercise is a slow twitch muscle activity. It's for muscle endurance. Okay, muscle endurance is the ability of a muscle to contract over and over and over again without getting tired. That's walking, that's riding a bike, a treadmill, elliptical, that's muscle endurance. It's great, it's wonderful. I love cardio, I love riding my bike, but it's not really a big strength boosting activity. When you are, say, walking in the mall, and I, I know sometimes malls open up earlier and the older folks can walk around the mall, I think that's great. But walking in the mall is a muscle endurance event. It's a slow twitch muscle fiber event. It works as slow twitch muscle fibers. It doesn't really work those fast twitch fibers. That's the, that's the muscle fibers we're talking about with sarcopenia. It's those fast twitch muscle fibers that are decimated as we get older. Walking in the mall ain't going to help us hold on to them. That's why we got to do resistance training. Got to do cardio, got to do resistance training as well. And when it comes to resistance training, again, I, I throw that word out sometimes like, you know, we're all supposed to know what that means, but resistance training means you're working through a resistance. You're moving your muscles through a resistance. And that could be just, you know, limited by your imagination, for goodness sake. You could do body weight exercises, like a push-up or a wall push-up, push-up against a wall, for instance, or maybe against your kitchen sink. You could use barbells and dumbbells if you're more advanced. Those are free weights, okay? And every gym has those. Or again, if you're in a gym, you could use machines. Most, you know, big chain gyms are in every neighborhood. They always have a lot of machines, okay? You can use them. Heck, if you want to work out at home, resistance bands are great as well. Again, your body doesn't know it's working against a rubber band or a dumbbell or a kettlebell. All it knows is it's working against some sort of resistance. When you put a resistance on those muscles, they contract, they work, they get stronger, they increase muscle protein synthesis, and you're increasing the protein synthesis the most in those muscle fibers that are not being worked, the fast twitch muscle fibers. So you're limited only by your imagination. Again, you could use whatever it is you have. And I want you to realize, I, I've said resistance training, some of you know it as strength training, and some people equate strength training with lifting heavy weights. No, you don't have to lift heavy. Matter of fact, at first, I don't want you to lift heavy, and you don't need to do lots and lots of sets and lots and lots of reps, and you don't need to spend hours in the gym. For most people listening to me right now, one set per exercise is all you need. One set per exercise will significantly increase muscle strength and to a degree muscle size as well. I also think that's a message that needs to get out to the fitness world. Uh, you got a lot of personal trainers out there that are under the impression that they got to work people, you know, doing four sets of this and five sets of this and three sets of this. For most people, one set will improve muscle strength. No need to be doing multiple set programs for a lot of people. As a matter of fact, there's research showing one set does indeed increase significantly muscle strength. Remember, we're talking muscle strength here. The more sets you do, yeah, that's probably gonna increase muscle strength to a degree, but you're also increasing muscle endurance. And it gets a little complicated here, but the real reason I'm telling you this is 
I'm assuming that a lot of you right now are listening to me, you know, you're, you're not professional athletes. Neither am I. <laughs> and so because of that, you don't need to spend a whole lot of time in the gym. You don't need to be, you know, doing a thousand reps and lifting a, a bus or anything like that. You pick some resistance that you can lift somewhere between maybe 10 and 20 repetitions. That's it. When you get to about 10 or 20 repetitions, you say to yourself, you know, could I do three or four more? And if you say to yourself, no, that's the sweet spot. When you got about three or maybe three or four, you're like, eh, maybe I could do it, maybe I'm not. Um, you're kind of getting close to what's called muscle failure. I don't want you to go to muscle failure, especially if you're using barbells and dumbbells because that's not safe. But, you know, when you're you're pushing the envelope a little bit, all right? That's what's the that's the stimulus for what's going to cause your muscles to grow. If you are going to the gym or even working on your own, some of you may actually have home gyms where you have these big machines in the gym where you could do a whole bunch of different exercises. You could do that if you want, but in terms of preserving muscle the most, I would recommend, especially if you're just starting out, let's just focus on three different muscle groups. The three muscle groups that I would suggest you focus on the most are your biggest muscle groups. They are the chest, the back, and the legs. That's it. The chest, the back, and the legs. They are your biggest muscle groups. And again, in terms of the legs, that's where you actually have a lot of those fast twitch muscle fibers. The powerful fibers are in your legs and in your butt. So for instance, if you were in a gym, you could do three exercises. For instance, you could do a chest press exercise, a leg press exercise, and maybe a seated row or a lat pull down exercise. They both tend to work the back muscles. That's it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to be doing all kinds of other exercise in gym. Chest, back, legs, one set of each. That's it. You work those three muscle groups on a regular basis, that's going to go a long way to reversing sarcopenia. Now, I know what a lot of you are probably saying, hey, Joe, what about the arms? You can work the arms if you want, but you don't need to be working your arms. Why? You're already working your arms. Think about it. If you're doing a, a chest exercise and a back exercise, you're also working the arms. They're already along for the ride. So it's not necessary to be doing bicep curls and tricep work or anything like that. They're already being worked. Again, I'm assuming that you may have limited time when you work out. That's a possibility. Or maybe you don't want to work out. That's a possibility too. I like working out, but a lot of people don't. Okay. So let's make this as painless as we possibly can. Work those big muscle groups, the chest, the back, the legs. Start with one set, uh, maybe a, a resistance you could lift anywhere, again, from about tw maybe 10 to 20 reps. That's going to go a long way to helping reverse that sarcopenic process. And yeah, reverse. I like using the R word once in a while, reverse. You can reverse this. Sometimes tell people a study, one of my most favorite studies. Yeah, I got, I have studies that are my favorite. They don't let me out much, but <laughs> this is my very favorite, one of my very, very favorite studies ever. It actually happened a long time ago, back in the nineties, actually even before that, maybe the eighties, late eighties, they used to think that older people couldn't lift heavy weight. And so some research scientists said, let's test that. And so they went into a nursing home. I'm guessing this happened in a nursing home because these were really frail, feeble, older adults. The average age, if I remember correctly, was about 90 years old. A lot of these people could barely walk. They were, you know, using, you know, walkers, stuff like that. They didn't have a lot of strength. And basically for one month, they had them do the leg extension exercise machine. They brought a leg extension in, but they had them do basically one set of of, of these, of this leg extension exercise for one month. And what did they find? After a month, these really old people got about 170% stronger. Their thigh muscles increased by about 170% strength. Wow. Not only that, they could walk faster and they, a lot of them didn't even need their walkers or their canes anymore because their balance improved. Their balance improved just from doing that leg extension exercise. That's it. Oh, and one more thing. They actually took measurements of their little skinny thigh muscles and their thigh muscles started to get bigger. Yeah, bigger thigh muscles. 
from just doing one exercise. This was the watershed moment in resistance exercise training that age is not a barrier to getting bigger and stronger and faster. They got bigger, they got stronger, they got faster. Now, I don't want you to think that everybody's going to get 170% stronger. Remember, these people started out basically at square one. So that doesn't necessarily mean everybody's going to get 170% stronger. It depends on where you're starting from. But it is proof that everybody can improve. Your muscles can get stronger. Your muscles can get bigger. And your quality of life can improve by just doing, in this case, one exercise. <laughs> I'm advocating a little bit more than that because I want your upper body muscles to be stronger too. But it is proof that you don't need to do a lot to see big improvements. And those big improvements happen pretty quickly in about a month. So right then and there, exercise, resistance training, that's the best thing I would suggest overall if we're trying to reverse sarcopenia and improve the quality of life. So if you did nothing else, I would say that's the big thing to do. The other thing I would suggest you do is eat a better diet. Eating a better diet, I think, is the other aspect of sarcopenia that does not really get talked very much a lot. So remember that sarcopenia is associated with free radical damage. Free radicals disrupt normal cellular processes, and this in turn can reduce the functioning capabilities of the muscle. So by eating more antioxidant-rich foods, you can reduce free radical damage. Antioxidants are the things that neutralize free radicals from doing harm. So what kind of foods am I talking about here? Well, you know, probably fruits, veggies, seeds, beans, tea. Yeah, tea, green tea, black tea, any kind of tea. All tea has antioxidants. So all these foods contain lots and lots and lots of antioxidants. Turns out those antioxidants, they protect the plants. And when we eat them, they protect us too. That's how it works. That's how it works. So eating a better diet, more fruits, more veggies, more beans, more seeds, teas, they go a long way to helping dampen down free radical damage and helping, again, reduce that sarcopenic process. Notice, however, I did not say antioxidant supplements. I do want to talk about this because a lot of people may be saying, well, why can't I just go to the store and just buy a bottle of vitamin C? Vitamin C is a great antioxidant, right? Why can't I just do that? I'm going to suggest that you focus on the food and not the supplement. Number one, remember, they call them supplements because they're meant to supplement the diet, not replace it. So you got to put food first, supplement second. And that's the number one reason why I would say let's focus on the food and not necessarily take antioxidant supplements. And the other reason I would bring this up is that it's looking more and more like antioxidant nutrients work better when they are surrounded by all their other natural cohorts. In other words, they work better when they're in their natural environment. Food, not necessarily a vitamin pill or an antioxidant supplement, whether it's a liquid or a powder or whatever, it is looking like food is the better way to get these things. Something else to consider about the, the supplement, the antioxidant supplements, is that research is also starting to show that they may not be as healthy as they were once touted to be. For example, in one review of this topic, where researchers basically looked at 67 other antioxidant supplement studies, the researchers concluded that beta carotene, vitamin A, and vitamin E, three popular antioxidant supplements, I'll point out, these three antioxidant nutrients appeared to increase the risk of dying from everything. Let me say that again. Antioxidant supplements, beta carotene, vitamin A, and vitamin E, seem to be associated with an increased risk of death. 
As a matter of fact, I've actually talked about this in previous episodes. I think if you uh, go back in the archives to episode 37 and 38, I usually, I didn't talk about this week, but I usually talk about the myth of the week. And somewhere in the beginning of those, I talked about the research on vitamin E and beta carotene. Uh, It's actually kind of interesting. So I'd go back to 37, 38 to learn more about that. But again, these antioxidant nutrients may not be as healthy, especially when you're taking lots and lots of them. Why is that, by the way? It may be that high doses of these antioxidant nutrients, maybe they're not so healthy because they begin to start to act like pro-oxidants. I'll say that again. It may be that these antioxidants become pro-oxidant. Well, what the heck is a pro-oxidant? A pro-oxidant is something that makes free radicals. Yeah, we've heard for decades that antioxidants neutralize free radicals, and that's true, but depending on certain circumstances, they could actually turn around and actually make free radicals. So it could be that maybe some of these antioxidant nutrients may not be so healthy because they actually increase the very thing that we think they're knocking out. Free radicals. They're making more of them. That's one of the theories behind why some of these research studies are showing that they may not be as good for us as we once thought. Another reason why I'd say put the emphasis on food. You're not going to have the same problem eating a carrot as, say, taking a beta-carotene supplement, which, by the way, I don't think anybody should be taking a beta-carotene supplement. Again, go back to 37 and 38 and you'll find out the reason why. But again, pro-oxidation, another topic is not talked about. Remember, Sarcopenia is associated with an increase in free radical damage. Taking these high potency antioxidant supplements may actually speed up the sarcopenia process. Now, I know some of you are saying, Joe, you're taking a leap here. You're speculating. I'm speculating, but I'm also backing this up with some research that suggests these antioxidant nutrients in high concentrations may not be as good as what some so called experts out there want you to believe. The other reason why I think it's better to put the emphasis on antioxidant-rich foods and not supplements is that there have been some studies out there that appear to show they don't work well with exercise. Remember, I'm going to say exercise is the number one thing you can do for sarcopenia. Well, it turns out that there are some studies out there that appear to show that antioxidant supplementation may actually reduce the beneficial effects of exercise, especially specifically, for instance, uh, we know that exercise can help blood pressure and say vasodilation, the opening up of blood vessels. Well, it turns out that in some studies where they actually gave people antioxidant supplements after exercise, those supplements appeared to reduce reduce the beneficial effects of exercise on lowering blood pressure and helping improve blood vessel health, vasodilation. So exercise didn't work so well when it was combined with antioxidant supplements. That's why when it comes to antioxidant supplements, I just don't like them as well as I like eating the colorful foods. Remember, the the colors, the colors of the foods, they are the antioxidants. The colors of the foods are the antioxidants. So when you go to the grocery store and you're in the fruit and the veggie aisle, all those red and orange and purple and yellow and green colors you see, those are the antioxidants. And again, they protect the plant. We eat the plants. They in turn protect us. That's how it works. So The other thing I point out to you if you're looking to offset sarcopenia, reverse it, improve it, is maybe eat some more protein. As a rule, generally speaking, protein is probably going to help muscle preservation. It's going to help us uh, improve our muscle protein synthesis. And the recommended dietary allowance for protein is about 0.4 grams per pound. But it turns out that older folks might need more. That RDA for protein might not necessarily be enough for older folks trying to build muscle, especially if they are doing resistance exercise. Lack of protein, as I pointed out, might accelerate muscle loss because again, your body may go around looking for some alternative fuel source and start picking apart amino acids to turn them into sugar. 
And that's that gluconeogenesis phenomenon I mentioned a little while ago. So perhaps maybe if you're looking to preserve muscle, go a little bit more than the RDA, not a lot more. Generally, if I had to spitball this, I'd say maybe 0.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight. That's how they figure out how much protein you need based on your body weight. And maybe 0.6 grams, which is just a little bit more than the RDA, might be better. So how much is that? So just do the math. For instance, if we just take your body weight and multiply it times 0.6, you get your that would get you your art your your amount of protein. For instance, if you were 160 pounds, 160 times 0.6, that's 96 grams of protein per day. You don't need all that at one time. Spread it out throughout the day, maybe you know 20, 25 grams at a time, and I think that's going to do a have a better anabolic effect than if you just took it all at one time in one big say protein shake. So spreading it out, I think, is a better way of doing it. So whatever you get, say 96 grams, 100 grams, divided by the number of meals you eat per day, and that'll give you a better idea of how to spread that out. If you're looking at food, again, food labeling, the nutrition facts label, does tell you how much protein is in food per serving. So you could use those nutrition facts labeling that's on every you know box and can of whatever you're going to eat in America, it'll tell you. There's also all kinds of apps you can download onto your phone, et cetera, they'll tell you this as well. So use the food nutrition facts labeling to your advantage. Use apps on your phone. You could download stuff onto your computer, your iPad, whatever. It'll also give you an idea of how much protein you're using. If you're into using protein powders, again, there's a lot of protein powders out there. You can certainly use them as well. Personally, if I was shopping for a protein powder, I would look for one that has about 20 grams of protein per scoop. That's one of my rules when I look for protein powders, about 20 grams per scoop. Uh, And again, I think that's probably a a good sweet spot for most people. I also don't want a lot of calories generally for me, but again, if we're looking, if, if we're considering somebody who may be older, who's not eating very well, then maybe bumping up the calories in a protein shake might be a good way of, of helping this process as well. I can't talk about protein without bringing up certain amino acids, which you may have heard about. These three amino acids go by the collective name branch chain amino acids, BCAAs, they're abbreviated as. And the branch chain amino acids are as follows, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Leucine, isoleucine, and valine. These are the branch chain amino acids, and they are usually revered in the world of muscle building, especially leucine. Leucine in particular has a love affair with muscle protein synthesis. As a matter of fact, if you have any protein powders laying around your kitchen right now, uh, it's quite possible it even tells you on the label how much leucine it has. They may even on that label tell you how many branch chain amino acids it has as well. That's how fixed leucine is in the world of muscle building. So, It is possible that in addition to maybe taking a protein shake that contains leucine and these BCAA amino acids, maybe you're taking branch chain amino acid supplements. There are supplements that just contain uh, these three amino acids. And it's also quite possible you may be taking a supplement that only contains leucine because leucine is the all-star player, if you will, among those three amino acids. I think all three work better than leucine, by the way, but leucine does get a lot of attention in the muscle building world. And there is some research that, again, leucine appears to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. I can tell you, I've seen this research. It is quite interesting. All the research is not positive, however, when it comes to leucine. Again, that makes things more complicated. For instance, I remember very well back in the 1990s, there was a lot of research out there on a metabolite of leucine. It was called HMB. HMB is a breakdown metabolite of leucine. HMB has a big word name. It's it's beta hydroxy beta methyl butyrate. <laughs> now you know why they call it HMB. But you know, it, it's it's actually a breakdown product of leucine. And there were studies in the 1990s that appeared to show that when you gave this HMB supplement to people, that they got stronger. And I I actually remember a lot of bodybuilders asking me about this back in the 90s. 
and uh, they, were, they were taking it and it was really expensive. It's still actually quite expensive, by the way. You still can buy uh, HMB supplements. But the problem, however, with HMB is it seemed to work better in beginners. It didn't work so well in those bodybuilders that were gobbling it up by the pound. So again, you, when you're looking at research on branched chain amino acids and muscle building supplements, you always got to wonder, you know, who were the research uh, conducted on? In, in the case of HMB, it was actually conducted on uh, not real athletes, not bodybuilders, but on, again, older adults. Because of that, it is possible that HMB as well as leucine is marketed to people with sarcopenia to help that muscle protein synthesis it is possible it may help, but I, I, I'm usually a fan that, you know, the simple answer is the more correct answer. And that's just let's go with the food and let's not worry about leucine amino acids or branched chain amino acids or HMB. It, it gets back to muscle itself. Muscle is made of just more than one amino acid. Eight, for instance, there's eight different amino acids we need to build muscle. Those eight amino acids are called essential amino acids. They're called essential because we can't make them in the body. We got to get them through food or you know, amino acid supplement for that matter. Leucine is just one of those eight essential amino acids. To build muscle, you need more than just leucine. And so that's why I think just loading up on leucine or its metabolite HMB or just the branched chain amino acids, I think it's a short sighted thing to do. I would rather you, for instance, maybe try a protein shake than say individual amino acids. You're going to get more protein in the protein shake than say an amino acid pill or an amino acid powder, or simply just taking one amino acid like leucine. So I'm a bigger fan of protein more than individual amino acids when it comes to building muscle. But again, I would also put, again, more emphasis on strength training than, again, any protein supplement or any amino acid supplement. If you're thinking about a protein supplement, I'll, I'll throw some links in a in description to some brands that I like. There are some good brands out there. There are some expensive brands out there, and there are some good brands that don't cost an arm and a leg, and I'll throw them in the description so you can check them out if it's something you want to look at yourself. You can mix the powder in water or you can do what I did for breakfast this morning. You can throw that protein powder in a blender and make a big smoothie out of them with fruits and veggies. I tend to put frozen spinach in my smoothie. I put lima beans and broccoli, frozen broccoli uh, florets in my in my blender and I grind that up and I throw in some chocolate protein powder and I drink it. And I do that because if I'm going to be drinking broccoli and spinach, it's got to taste good. And for me, that, that, means, that means chocolate. So again, you, you can mix them in water if you want, but I think when it comes to uh, you know, sarcopenia, again, remembering food as antioxidants. And if you don't eat like eating veggies, then, you know, you could put them in a smoothie and you could mix them with some chocolate or vanilla or strawberry protein powder, whatever, you, whichever you like. And I really want you to realize when I'm talking about protein, I'm not just talking about eating steak and tuna fish. I'm not talking about whey protein out there, which is very popular. If you are a vegetarian, a, you can eat vegetables, okay? And you could even opt for vegetarian protein powder if that's something you want to look into. They are out there and there's some fine veggie protein powders out there. But I don't want you to just get the impression when I say protein that I'm talking about eating steak or a hamburger or something like that. Vegetable protein counts as well when we're talking about helping sarcopenia. You can get and do get protein from fruits and vegetables. So that's good news for the vegetarians. And it's also good news for everybody because we're also under the impression for years and years, I don't know why we got this impression that you only get protein from eating hamburger or chicken or turkey or something like that. You can get protein. You do get protein from vegetarian sources as well. And these vegetarian sources can also help sarcopenia. So when it comes to helping sarcopenia, yes, I do think it's a national security problem. And yes, I do think it's a healthcare problem, a public health problem. But I also know there's something that we can do about this. This is not something that has to happen. Sarcopenia does not have to occur. Staying physically active and eating well can go a long way to preserving muscle mass and muscle strength as we get older and even reversing sarcopenia. This, in turn, is going to lead to fewer health problems and a better quality of life as we get older.
So I hope this really long discussion on sarcopenia has helped you understand this very complicated process better. Again, it's complicated, but the cure, if you will, doesn't necessarily have to be complicated. Move more, work those muscles, eat better, boom. Sarcopenia does not have to be as big a deal as it is, especially all we got to do is take care of ourselves. If you want to get a hold of me to learn more about sarcopenia, I'm really easy to find. You can find me at either one of my websites, joe-cannon.com or joe-cannon.com or supplementclarity.com or just Google Joe Cannon Vitamins, Joe Cannon Health, Joe Cannon Fitness. I'm going to pop up. Don't just type in Joe Cannon. <laughs> I did this recently. There was a speaker of the House of Representatives who lived about 100 years ago. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a there was a Joe Cannon soccer player. That's not me either. I think there's a baseball player with guy who's got my name. Yeah, that's not me. So put a little qualifier in there. Joe Cannon Health, Joe Cannon Vitamins, Joe Cannon Supplements. You'll find me. <laughs> I'm pretty easy to find. I'm not those. I'm not the other Joe Cannons. As I often say, I, I'm I'm the poor Joe Cannon from the other side of the tracks. I'm not those other guys. So uh, again, reach out to me and I'll, I'll be glad to help you any way I possibly can. With that, I'm going to bring this episode to a close. Wow, this is a long episode. We're well over an hour this week. Uh, so again, I, I want to go a little longer with certain topics. I think they deserve a longer, more in-depth discussion. But uh, hopefully you got a lot out of this. I know I know, I enjoyed talking about it a lot. And we'll talk about more about sarcopenia in, in coming episodes. But I want to at least get uh, the, the, the baseline out there. So get, at least get you thinking about it more. With that, I will bring this long episode to a close with the quote of the week, and it comes to us from the Dalai Lama. He's got some interesting sayings, but I like this one uh, particularly. He said, our prime purpose in life is to help others, and if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. Pretty good words. I don't know where they come up with these great words, but uh, yeah, I, I wish I had said something as, as profound as that. Until next week, gang, and I am Joe Cannon. Go out, be safe, and where you can, try to help others and try to make a difference.